The film about to start on four is The Conversation, a psychological thriller starring Gene Hackman. On Granada at 10.40, Viewpoint 92 looks at our obsession with money. Now, tonight's News at 10. to a privatised rail service. Brothers cleared of sex shop murder after seven years in jail. Industry says there's no point making when there's no one buying. Abandoned in Sarajevo, British doctors are on their way. And the Indian city where catching AIDS costs just 20 pence. Good evening. The government has unveiled its plans to privatise the nation's railways, saying more competition will mean improved quality. Passenger services will be franchised, opening the way for newcomers such as Virgin's Richard Branson. But the track will stay in state hands for now. Labour said private operators wouldn't put up the investment needed. Hardline conservatives called it feather-bedded privatisation. The immediate plans will see freight and parcel businesses sold off, private companies running passenger services alongside BR, railway stations put up for sale or lease, and a new state body, Rail Track, controlling track and signalling. It's the biggest shake-up for more than 40 years, when the Great Western and other railway companies were nationalised. Now British Rail is being broken up and returned to the private sector, but the government says it's a step-by-step -step approach, with the loss-making freight and parcel services being sold off first, and slowly the passenger lines being franchised to private operators that could take to the end of the century. In the Commons, the Transport Secretary pledged to maintain grants and ensure safety on a privatised system. Altogether, they comprise the most radical changes to Britain's railways since 1948. But our flexible and practical approach to change will ensure that they are workable and realistic. But opposition MPs weren't impressed by the promises. This white paper will not increase our railway services, it will cut the rail network. It will not modernise the railways, it will privatise some bits of it. It will not produce new trains, it will mean new paint on old trains. So BR's role's now changing. It's to be split with one part remaining responsible for track and infrastructure. That's repairing and updating rolling stock and ageing engines, as well as overhead line maintenance. The other will run passenger services until they're taken over. But the chairman of BR says privatisation or not, investment must continue. An investment programme in excess of a billion pounds a year for the next ten years, that's what needs to be spent, and I'm sure that's understood by government. We'll, we'll be there to make sure that that money is spent, particularly as we're going to staff the track authority. This will be the future across Britain. Already stagecoach is operating a limited service in Scotland, and others are now drawing up their plans. Well, we're very interested. Um, we think it'll be uh, a great challenge. Uh, we think that we can uh, bring a better service than is currently offered, uh, and quite a different service. BR stations will also be offered for sale, but experts doubt so many separate elements can cooperate. It is, of course, a very complicated thing uh, to get all these staff to work together. It's a very severe management problem, but making these staff work in different companies isn't going to solve the problem. The final verdict on privatisation will come from the public. They won't travel if it fails. The more immediate worry is for staff. BR employs more than 130,000. How many will keep their jobs in a privatised industry? Two brothers who have spent seven years in jail for murdering the manageress of a sex shop in Swansea are tonight celebrating freedom. Wayne and Paul Darvell were cleared by the Court of Appeal. The judges will give their precise reasons later, but the Crown agreed the convictions were unsafe because fresh evidence showed South Wales Police made up the confession of one of the brothers. Two more innocent men freed, two more victims of a miscarriage of justice. The elder of the brothers, Paul, says he was driven bald by the stress of it. After seven years wrongfully in prison, their thoughts now were clearly on freedom. What do you want to do tonight? Yeah. Yeah. They'd been convicted in 1986 of the murder of the manageress of this Swansea sex shop. She'd been raped and then battered to death. No forensic evidence was found to link the brothers to the crime. 
but Wayne made a partial confession. It was shown at the appeal to be highly unreliable. He had a history of confessing to things he hadn't done. The now familiar ESDA test revealed police notebooks supposedly used to take down the confession hadn't been issued until months after the event. A number of officers have already been suspended. South Wales police tonight expressed regret and said the case would be reopened. I think if there's any lesson to be drawn out of this, this case, it is the tunnel vision that sometimes occurs in a police force. They think they've got the right person for the best reasons or the worst reasons in the world, and they entirely focus on, the, on, on, on making a case against that sort of person. The Home Office itself is currently looking at another 800 cases of alleged injustice. It took seven years for the Darbells to prove their innocence. Critics say the system's in crisis. Today's case is merely an illustration of a whole series of cases uh, that currently face the the criminal justice system and have really plunged it into crisis. It's a classic potpourri of uncorroborated confessional evidence, dubious forensics, dubious witness evidence and so on. The need for legal reform is no longer in dispute. Today's case is likely only to strengthen the calls for that change to come quickly. Jennifer Nadel, News at 10, Central London. British industry is stuck firmly in recession. The government's own figures showed today. Manufacturing output fell by 0.6% in May, energy output by more than 2%. A survey of company directors out tomorrow predicts little improvement, but still Mr Major said there'd be no change in policy, this time in reply to Mr Kinnock in the Commons. Manufacturing has been fighting a lone battle to break out of recession, but today that battle appeared lost there's still not enough demand for the products which industry is making. There now seems little substance to the government's claim that recovery took root in the second quarter of this year. And tonight a new survey of company directors dashed hopes of any full recovery before 1993. Well, the main reason is bad debt and cash flow. This is a burden that companies are finding crippling. It is forcing many under. They're having to wait longer to be paid, and I think this is removing the chances of many companies to expand and therefore putting off the day of any recovery. But as ministers left this morning's cabinet meeting, the last before the summer recess, they were in no doubt that inflation, not recovery, was still the main concern. John Major told them his commitment to the exchange rate mechanism remained 100%. In the Commons later, Neil Kinnock urged the government to change course. Can I put it to the Prime Minister that his strategy of perpetuating recession and high unemployment in an attempt to suppress inflation, has all of the features in that combination of the slump of the 1930s. But the Prime Minister was sticking by his forecasts and his policies. I know it is not easy. I know it is uncomfortable. I know it is frustrating when that growth doesn't immediately appear. But I know of no other way to ensure the medium and long-term growth and prosperity of our nation The fight against inflation is proving successful but yielding few rewards so far. In the past 12 months, it's fallen by around 1.5%. Over the same period, high street sales have remained flat, and manufacturing output, on which so many hopes were pinned, failed to get off the ground. Ross Group, near Southampton, makes electrical goods. On the face of it, devaluing the pound would help the company by giving it a price advantage over foreign competitors. Even so, it regards devaluation as a dirty word. I think we've always likened devaluations as going on a world cruise. It's great fun for a short period of months, but you pay the price for a long time afterwards. Since the beginning of June, the pound's fallen anyway by almost eight fennigs. High interest rates are needed to keep it above the rate of 2 marks 78, its lower limit within the exchange rate mechanism. Critics say that if the need to support sterling was removed, interest rates could be cut. But the Chancellor knows that the currency markets will seize any suggestion of devaluation as an excuse to sell the pound. July is renowned as the month of the sterling crisis, and that's exactly what he would face. On the foreign exchanges today, the pound's been a bit steadier after yesterday's sharp fall, but it will remain susceptible to sudden shocks until Thursday's meeting of the German Central Bank. If the Germans then decide to put up their interest rates, there's a real danger that the UK will have to follow suit. Greg Wood, News at 10, in the city. 
A new attempt was launched tonight to save the European fighter aircraft project and the thousands of British defence jobs that depend on it. Britain, together with Italy and Spain, has decided to seek an urgent meeting with the German defence minister to urge him to reconsider Germany's decision to pull out. The defence secretary, Malcolm Rifkin, said there was more than enough time to identify cost savings. Defence Secretary Malcolm Rifkin linked hands with his Spanish and Italian counterparts this morning, praying they'll stay with Britain in the European fighter programme, even if the Germans won't. Instead, they told him IFA must continue as a four-nation programme, preferably with the Germans back in. It's important to, to keep the, the initial group, also, also for political reasons. So it's essential to have four countries, you think? In my opinion, yes. Cost is the key. They want up to 30% off the current price. Spain and Italy think it may be achievable by trimming the electronics and weapons. Germany said it can't be done with the EFA airframe and engines. Industry will now try to produce a catalogue of economies, many involving a reduction in the aircraft's capability. They're being asked to offer a range of models with a price and performance to suit different countries. British industry sources say they're far from convinced it's a solution that can work. There was no commitment today that the project could go ahead with just three countries. No, no, we are going to very, we hope to meet with our German colleague in the near future and we hope we can persuade the Germans to re-involve themselves in the programme. That is the desirable objective. Officials of the Defence Ministry insist that from the military point of view they can see no real alternative to the European fighter aircraft. But military requirements will no longer determine the fate of this project Political issues have taken over, particularly the need to get the Germans back on board. Geoffrey Archer, News at 10, at the Defence Ministry. Miss Alison Holford, the Assistant Chief Constable of Merseyside, appears to be coming to some sort of private agreement with the force over her sex discrimination case. Miss Holford has claimed she was passed over for promotion because she was a woman. Her police authority will meet on Friday. It's reported that members will discuss giving her a cash settlement and ending disciplinary action if she drops her case and leaves her job. Leaders from Serbia, Bosnia and Croatia have begun arriving in London for peace talks tomorrow with Lord Carrington, the European community's negotiator. With efforts now underway to rescue the children of Sarajevo, the director of the city's orphanage has appealed for help for her children. Their orphanage has been wrecked. They shelter from the shelling in cellars. These are the abandoned war orphans of Lovista Evasic, healthy and fit children with an astonishing resilience who've somehow escaped the wounds of war, but who lost their parents in it. Children waiting for someone they hope will take them away. <laughs> Natasha is nine. Her father was killed in the fighting. She doesn't know where her mother is. Modriag, also nine and very shy, lost his family a month ago. No one knows how or where. And Amela, the name means clever, was left by her mother here, who never came back. It is extraordinary, is it not? that here we have upwards of 200 children in one hostel that comes frequently under bombardment who could be flown out to safety, to new homes, at least until this war is over. And yet someone somewhere along the line is saying no, or at least not yet. And the idea of taking a busload of children or sick, for example, from here to the airport is really quite bizarre. There is no way that we want to get involved in a firefight with uh, refugees, children, sick or whatever going to the airport. This orphanage is one of many in Bosnia. It's been hit time and again by the Serbs, which is why the orphan babies are now kept underground without daylight or fresh air. Nor is there any electricity, which is why those who care for them want them flown out to foster homes until this war is over. I don't wish, but he must go. Must go. There, we haven't food. We haven't uh, clothes. Nice. She wants others to care now, and who wouldn't care for these babies without names known only by the colours of their jumpsuits? Unless somebody outside of this besieged city does something, somebody with clout, then this is where the orphans of Lubista Evasic will remain, like it or not, until this war ends. Michael Nicholson, News at 10, Sarajevo. 
A team of 12 British doctors and nurses flew out to Zagreb in Croatia tonight on their way into Sarajevo. They'll treat the sick and injured children there. The Prime Minister has also asked them to report back on what extra help is needed. The team members are no strangers to international rescue operations. Within hours of the government's announcement, much-needed medical supplies were being loaded aboard an aircraft at Manchester Airport. The four tons included drugs, oxygen cylinders, blood and operating equipment. All bound for the beleaguered city at Sarajevo, the aircraft took off just a few minutes ago. The team of 12 doctors and nurses are all volunteers experienced in disaster relief. Most of them worked in the aftermath of the Armenian earthquake, and although this will be their first venture into a war zone, they say they're prepared. We're quite well prepared this trip, as we know what equipment to take. We're aiming to do up to 100 operations, depending on what we find, and we're well equipped to do that. The children of Zalitivo will be their first priority. The doctors won't know until they arrive whether they'll be able to treat them in the city or evacuate them to Zagreb. It all goes according to plan. This could be just the first of the mercy flights from Britain. Once this team have assessed what they need, more supplies could be on their way tomorrow. This first team is expected to work in Yugoslavia for just over a week before being replaced by other volunteers. Harry Smith, News at 10, Manchester. Health officials in India are warning of an AIDS epidemic raging out of control in the city of Bombay. A combination of widespread prostitution and almost total ignorance about contraception is allowing the virus to spread unchecked. One doctor alone is trying to hold back the tide, a special report from Bombay in part two. Plus the British oarsman who's chasing three Olympic golds in a row. And nothing became him more than the manner of his passing. That's in a couple of minutes. Over the last five years, One Building Society has helped more than a million people find the right mortgage scheme to suit them. In fact, we've given more money to more people for more mortgages than anyone else. So if you want to get into a new home, you know who to talk to. Now everything is easy because of... Get a little extra help from the Halifax. Bye. I think you're next, sir. Yeah. What's it to be, then? Just a trim. You could have a Lionel Blair cut, like mine. Lionel Blair doesn't have his hair cut like yours. That's if he comes here. Time for a sharp exit. Time for a cool, sharp hub. Pint of heart, please, Chief. Here's a unique opportunity to advertise your leisure-related business on Granada. The less than you think, whatever the event, wherever it's happening, fitness, fun, or going to the sun, you could be advertising on Granada, and we'll even make your TV commercial free. Don't miss out. Ring Martin Jackson on 061-832-7211 for more details. I do solemnly swear to do what's right by these four walls. I shall arm myself with Dulux weather shield sand textured paint with its unique ICI durable polymer. I shall not stint, nor skimp, nor corners cut. I like the bandit that did me guttering. For here shall I stand in days to come and say, I did that. Award-winning engines, quality, three doors, five doors.
tools. And to top it all off, a top of the props. Rover 200. It's everything you expect, and much, much more. AIDS virus is spreading so fast in the Indian city of Bombay that doctors believe half the women there will have the virus by the end of the decade. Widespread and cheap prostitution has allowed the virus to run wild and ignorance about the disease stretches to the medical profession. In this special report, our Far East correspondent Mark Austin looks at how India is slowly awakening to the crisis. <laughs> With the break of day in Bombay, India's second largest city comes alive. Somehow this teeming metropolis of millions survives chronic overpopulation and poverty. But now there's another threat. In the back streets, a cascade of colour, an around-the-clock industry at work. 200,000 prostitutes selling their bodies for as little as 20 pence. For these girls, some desperately young, the crowded, squalid brothels are their only home. Here, it's sex to survive, or is it to die? Already 50% have the AIDS virus, but they ply their trade regardless. I don't know what the hell AIDS is, so how can I be afraid of death? In this port city, crawling with men, many working away from their wives or single, it's estimated 600 a night get infected. In this story, the figures defy belief. More than half a million men visit prostitutes in slums like this one every day in Bombay alone. Given the almost total lack of sex education here, the implications for the spread of AIDS in India are frightening. If we consider there are, with lowest estimate, one million HIV positive in India, by the end of this century, there will be nearly 15 to 20 million HIV positive in India. He's positive again. He's positive again here. So they're all positive? Yes, all positive. The wards of government hospitals are filling up with sex workers and their clients. A young boy, promiscuous, got uh, HIV positive, detected about two years ago. The chances are he will die. He knows it, his father knows it. Dr. Janak Maniar makes the startling claim that more than 90% of Indian doctors many untrained in even basic sex education are too frightened to treat these AIDS patients and shun contact. This young man needs a life-saving operation, but he's HIV positive and already two surgeons have refused to do it. And we don't know still when he will be operated. I have my own doubts. One man who isn't frightened, Dr. Ishwa Gilada, with a garland of condoms and megaphone in hand, He's taken his AIDS prevention campaign to the streets. He accuses the Indian government of apathy. He's launched his own privately funded condom crusade. In the red light district, it's catching on. While we filmed, this man approached Dr. Gilada. After going to prostitutes for 15 years, he was convinced he had AIDS. He'd never used a condom, never even heard of them. Bombay's top health official denies the government is doing nothing. He invited us to film a crisis meeting where an AIDS counselling and publicity drive was being planned. Critics charge, it's too little, too late. Look at the size and the population and the enormity of the problem. So it certainly takes time. But to say that nothing has been done is absolutely wrong. Just a couple of years, it will be a huge spread of, like, like Africa, worse than in Africa even. Worse than in Africa even. We are not very far away from it. Indians have traditional rituals for exorcising evil, but ridding this giant nation of the spectre of AIDS won't be so simple. Long into the evening, Dr. Gilada and his team spread the message of prevention. But on the streets, the prostitutes continue the business of selling AIDS. 20p a time. Mark Austin, News at 10, Bombay. Italian radio says the Pope has a tumour on his colon and is to have an operation tomorrow. Another report said the tumour was non-cancerous. The Vatican refused to comment. 
The Bill Clinton show is now in full swing in New York as Democrats turn their convention into the launch of a crusade to win back the White House. There's little political debate, but a great deal of optimism. It's going his way, promising polls, a reshaped party, surging confidence. People are beginning to believe in the possibility of change again. Democrats were looking for a boost from this convention. They're getting it. And as far as this White House is concerned, honey, you can turn out the lights. The party's over. No second term. They taunted President Bush and found time, too, for the other challenger, Ross Perot. We've got us a race between an aristocrat, an autocrat, and a Democrat. The optimism here is giddy, but fewer voters than ever before are watching. And Democrats remember bitterly their last euphoric convention, the collapse and defeat that followed. I think we learned a very painful lesson in 1988, and that is that, in his own words, George Bush will do anything to get elected, or re-elected for that matter. So I think we have to be ready for that. In between the razzmatazz tonight, their most conservative party manifesto in decades. There'll be little public debate. They say they can't risk it. Turning the optimism here into votes from an electorate optimistic about nothing and skeptical of Bill Clinton won't be easy. Whatever the delegates say, whatever the polls suggest, the Democrats have their work cut out. Bill Neely, News at 10, New York.